Hello everyone. Welcome to another part of What If Decker Ran an Orphanage. If you enjoy the story, please like, subscribe, and share the video. It really helps me out. I did not write the story. The original writer is Kayadon. Please go support them. Now let us dive in. Animal Frankenstein. Hey, Izuku, Fu said to get his attention as they were eating. Is something wrong, Fu? Normally Fu didn't talk while he ate or did anything while he ate for that matter. He normally just ate like his life depended on it. No, I just had a weird thought, Fu said. So the meat I eat is used to replace my body when they rot or get ripped off right. Right? Izuka wondered where he was going with this. So that means my body is made up of a bunch of different animal meats, Fu said. I'm not a zombie, I'm an animal, Frankenstein. Izuka paused. Huh. There was a long pause as the two continued eating. Frankenstein was the name of the doctor, not the monster. Isuka corrected him. Fu looked confused. Then what was the name of the monster? It doesn't have one, it's just called Frankenstein's monster, Izuku explained. Fu didn't seem to like that answer. That's really dumb. Izuka shrugged. I haven't read the book, so I can't really say. To hold. Just hold still. I'm almost done. Izuka said, holding up the last needle. The government had provided him with a special chemical that when inserted into Sanson's acid would render it inert and change its color to blue. How long the chemical would last depended on how much of the chemical he gave her. The least he could give her would render her outer layer of goop inert, meaning she could still walk around and touch things while also being able to swap that outer layer with the acid inside her that would last about 10 hours. Or he could give her a full dose that would render all her acid inert. This would last about 24 hours. They also still had the suit just in case, but neither Sanson nor Izuku liked that option. The process of giving her the chemical was simple, however, it took some time. First, he would put on a special safety suit to protect him if he accidentally touched some of her acid. Then he would take a large needle and insert it into her repeatedly until he was done. What made this process a lot harder was that Sanson didn't ever like staying still, a part of her was always bouncing around and moving. He understood why, of course, she was stuck in a jar for a year and she wanted to move as much as possible and being made of slime also made it so she could move around in a way normal people couldn't. It still made it a pain to complete the process, though. Izuka watched as the last patch of green turned blue. There we go. And we're done. Go. Sanson jumped around, her entire body jiggling as she did so. Izuka smiled. Do you oof? He was interrupted as he was hit by a wet slept as Sanson burst onto his body. Cold. Izuku thought as Sanson deformed and wrapped around his body, covering his entire torso, then he felt her squeeze. It was like getting hugged by Jello. San? What are you doing? Izuku asked her, using the shortened version of her name. Sanson reformed her head on Izuku's chest and gave him a bright, cheerful smile. Rug. Wug? Izuka tried to figure out what she was trying to say. Contrary to what they first thought, it would be possible for her to talk. Kind of. Sanson was capable of changing her shape a lot. She could potentially change or turn into anything she wanted, including altering the shape of her throat to change what noises she could make. By doing this, presumably, she could one day speak like a somewhat normal person. That would take a long, long time though. She would have to master both her shape-shifting ability and her speaking ability. Right now she could kind of string broken words in incomplete sentences. Her words were distorted by her slimy throat, making them even harder to make out. Wug? Rug? No, there's no rugs in here. Oh, a hug. Izuka realized. You meant hug, right? Sanson's smile grew even wider and nodded. Her slimy hug grew even tighter. She seemed ecstatic like this was the best day of her life. She really likes hugs, wait. She never hugged me before. Or anyone until now. Izuka started thinking and then he remembered. Before this she was made entirely of corrosive acid if she touched anyone that could result in serious injury or death. Meaning she probably had never been hugged. Never been held. And never been touched. San Izuku called to her. Let's go get everyone and give them the biggest group hug we can. Yeah? She smiled brightly. TV time. Izuka walked into the living room and saw a peculiar sight. Sanson was in front of the TV trying to replicate what the characters were doing on screen with her stretchy limbs. The remote for the TV encased inside her torso. Kiba had her head through the ceiling and was flailing around while she stuck in the ceiling. Izuka sighed. San, can you get your sister out of the ceiling? 
Sansa nodded, her head moving like a bobblehead. She extended her arm, grabbing Kiba's foot before pulling her out of the ceiling, letting her fall onto the couch. It's a good thing no one lives in the house upstairs. Izuka thought. Aha. Finally, I have been released. Now to enact my vengeance. Kiba lunged for the remote inside of Sansen. In response, the gooey girl increased the size of her legs, stretching her body up to the ceiling and causing Kiba to miss, crashing into the floor. Curses. Kiba was ready to lunge again, but Izuka stepped in. Wait. Wait. Izuka got in between the two of them. What have I said about fighting? This isn't a fight. Kiba protested. A fight involves two people bringing harm upon each other until one is no longer capable of standing. Seeing as Sansen is incapable of being harmed, one cannot truly fight her. Izuka sighed. Well, you're technically not wrong. Still, no punching or kicking or lunging or any type of attacking in the house. Izuka pointed to the hole in the ceiling. But she has been hogging the television. I am currently not watching my favorite anime so she can watch the 10,000th Avengers movie. Kiba protested. Izuka understood what happened now. Kiba must have been trying to get the remote, and Sansen stretched her arm to the ceiling with the remote. Kiba tried to jump up to get it and missed, which ended up with her head getting stuck in the ceiling. He looked at the TV and the 567 Avengers movie, Avengers vs. the Fantastic Four. The two of them had rather different tastes in what they liked to watch. Most of the kids did. Aerie liked watching slice-of-life anime, comedies, and other light-hearted feel-good types of shows and movies and hated things with lots of violence or negativity. Kay liked basically anything but her favorites were comedies and mysteries. Fu only really enjoyed in-depth, character dramas, and only the really good ones too. He also tended to nitpick any movie he watched, even the ones he enjoyed. Kiba liked violent action shows, things that Izuka probably shouldn't be letting her watch, but considering she survived on the street for so long, she would probably be fine watching this. She was also particularly fond of anime due to its overdramatic tendencies. Sansen loved watching with lots of action, particularly superhero movies and shows. She especially loved characters that could stretch like herself. Izuka thought about how to handle this problem. Should I do a TV schedule? No, we're going to move soon and they'll probably have more TV to use for themselves, so there's no sense in doing that. All right, you two should handle things like big girls. If both of you want to watch TV, then you have to find a show you'll watch together. Izuka said. But the shows she watches are very different from the ones I watch. Kiba pointed out. No matter how different people's tastes are, you can probably find something they both like if you look hard enough, Izuka told them. And you might find something you like that you didn't think you would. Kiba seemed unconvinced but nodded anyway. Sansen agreed with that smile she always had on. It's like she was always happy no matter where she was although I would probably be happy to be anywhere after being in a jar for a year. Izuka thought, I'm going to go make dinner. If I see you two arguing about this again, I'll take away points. The two's eyes widened in fear, they nodded and immediately got onto the couch. Sanson took the remote out of her chest as the two surfed the endless content of the streaming services. A few hours later, Izuka walked into the living room ready to tell the two that dinner was ready. When he saw a familiar sight, the two of them were glued to the screen, Sanson wrapped around Kiba as they watched One Piece. Ah good. I love that show. And even better, by the time they catch up to the newer episodes, they'll be adults. Izuku thought happily. Do it for them. Izuku was sitting at his desk, hunched over and flipping through a book with one hand while lifting a small dumbbell with the other. Today his mother was home and had offered to watch the kids. Meaning he had taken the day to do some self-improvement. A lot of self-improvement. Since he was going to be taking care of a lot of children, there were a lot of things he had to do. Firstly, he studied a lot of medical books. If he needed to care for kids, then making sure to keep them healthy, especially in case of an emergency. He also did a lot of studying on court counseling and court theory. Part of his contract required him to get his court counseling license sometime with the year. These two subjects were actually really easy for Zuku as a lot of it was just learning how quirks worked and how they affected the users, something that Izuku already studied beforehand. He was also studying psychology. He wanted to understand the minds of the kids he was taking care of so he could help them better. There were also teaching books so he could properly provide an education for them. The contract said that how they were educated was up to his discretion and he wanted to do it personally. He felt it would make them more comfortable. 
Oh, and then there was cooking. The kids might get tired of eating from the wide, but still limited selection of what Izuka could make, so he needed to learn how to make more food. He was also learning how to improve his cooking and how to find the best ingredients because these kids deserve the best. Lastly, he was also looking at biology. Looking at the biology in people with quirks that didn't majorly alter their bodies might help him figure out what to do with kids whose quirks do majorly alter their bodies. And while he was doing all that, he also decided to improve his body. He was going to need all the strength, speed, and especially stamina to keep up with everyone. I feel exhausted. Izuka thought, maybe I should stop, no. I need to keep working. To give them a better future. He looked at the clock. It was 7 o'clock at night. He started at 6. Meaning he'd been working and studying for 13 hours. Ah crap. I need to plan out next week. Their education, their cork training, what are we going to do for fun, what am I going to cook? Izuka quickly put away all of his books and his weights and took out a bunch of papers with different templates on them. One was for planning their activities, the other was to list any supplies they might need, and the last was a meal planner in which Izuku would plan what was going to be cooked and what he needed to cook them. He needed these planners because otherwise, he would have to make these plans on the spot. And making plans that took into account the different personalities, tastes, and desires of six kids took time. Of course, he didn't need to strictly stick to these plans, they were more of a guideline. One that he would follow if nothing else came up. It took him another two hours to finish. Izuka sat back in his chair. He was so tired. I have to keep working. Izuku's eyes were closing. I have to. The green-haired boy fell into a deep sleep. Minutes later, Kay walked into the room. Izuku, can we? She stopped when she saw Izuku was asleep. She ran out of the room and into the living room. Guys! Izuku fell asleep at his desk again. Kay said. Did he overwork again? Ari asked in concern. He really must learn to stop doing that, Kiba said, getting up off the couch. He's doing it for us, Fu said. He really wants us to be happy. I know that. Kiba stopped her act for a moment. I just wished he took better care of himself. Yay. Sanson agreed. Well, I can't argue with that, Fu said. They all got up and walked into Izuku's room. Sanson grew in size, becoming as tall as the room itself. Then she gently lifted Izuku off of his seat and moved him onto the bed. Then the goo girl climbed into bed next to him, snuggling up into his side. You're going to bed so soon, Sanson? Kay asked, we can still have a goo d time. That was terrible. Kiba groaned. You're saying my puns suck? Kay snickered. Why are you like this? Fu asked. Oh, not you too. You're just jealous that I'm better at puns than you'll ever, zombie. Kay laughed, covering her mouth so Izuka didn't wake up. I think they're funny, Ari admitted. Fu rolled his eyes. We should probably go to sleep now. I'll get the plastic sheet. Kiba, due to her immense strength, couldn't sleep next to anyone because she would accidentally squeeze them to death. Fu was the exception to this because he couldn't feel pain and could regenerate. However, they needed to put a plastic sheet wherever they slept because otherwise, Fu's blood would get everywhere. Kei and Eri crawled into bed with Izuku as they normally did. Sanson wrapped her arm around all three of them before extending her other arm over to the light switch and shutting it off. No books. Fu looked through Izuka's room, taking a bunch of his figures and posters and putting them into boxes. They had been packing up slowly over the past week, seeing as their new home wouldn't be ready for a while, they still had plenty of time. Today Fu had been tasked with picking up Izuka's hero merch. Seeing as he couldn't get tired, he was seen as the right person for the job. I knew Izuka had a lot of hero stuff, but now that I'm cleaning it, I'm starting to think he bought all the hero stuff in existence. He thought. After several minutes of taking down Izuku's stuff, he came to the closet. Wonder how much stuff is in here? Fu thought. He opened the closet and to his surprise, there was no hero merch. Rather, a pile of notebooks with the words hero analysis for the future. Hero analysis? What does analysis mean? Fu wondered. He was a smart kid and he had read through some of a dictionary, but of course, there were still plenty of words he was unfamiliar with. He opened up the notebooks and started reading. And reading and reading. Inside the notebooks were tons and tons of notes about quirks. Theories, observations, possible uses. Fu kept on reading for about an hour, intrigued by the content of the notebooks. Izuku wrote all this? Why? I mean it's really cool, but why did he write this? It's mostly heroes, so did Izuka want to be a hero? Fu asked. He was flipping through the last few pages. 
when he saw something odd. All the notes were incomplete and there were darkened spots littered across the pages like they had been wet by rain or tears. And the last sentence written in the notebook said, I can't keep doing this, it hurts too much every time I look at these things, it hurts, I can't be a hero, Kakens, right, I'm just a useless. Corkless Deku, I'm putting these notebooks away, one day I'll throw them out, I don't even know why I'm writing this. This was very alarming to Fu. For one, this proved that Izuka wanted to be a hero at one point, but it seemed like he thought that he couldn't for some reason. What's worse is that Izuka called himself useless, which Fu knew wasn't true and was a very harsh thing to call yourself, and apparently someone called Kaken was calling him this. This actually made Fu kinda mad, he probably would have been more upset if it weren't for the whole muted emotions thing. And then there was that word, corkless. Now, Fu had never seen or heard this word before, but it wasn't hard to figure out. Homeless people had no homes. Penniless people had no money. So corkless people must not have quirks. But that was impossible. At least to Fu. He had never seen a single person without a quirk. He had never even heard of someone without a quirk before. It had like being born without a head. Although now that he thought about some people were probably born without a head due to their quirk. Fu kept thinking about it. But what if there was a quirk that could take away quirks? That probably exists and if it happened to Izuku, then he wouldn't have a quirk. And it would explain why Izuku doesn't want to talk about his quirk. Now everything was starting to make sense. Why he'd never seen Izuku use his quirk, why Izuku never talked about his quirk. It's because it was taken away from him. Before Fu could continue his train of thought, the door opened up. Fu, what's taking you so long? Kiba walked in, followed by Eri, Kei, and Sanson. We came to check on you. Kei said. Are those Azuka's notebooks? Eri asked. Yeah, I think I finally figured out the secret behind Azuku's quirk, Fu said. One explanation later. Azuka had his quirk stolen. Kei gasped. I think so, Fu said. And there is some friend called Kakin who calls Azuka such degrading things. Kiba fumed. Even worse, it looks like Azuku believes it. Fu crossed his arms. But that's not true. Azuku's great. Kei protested. Goo. Sanson agreed with her. She didn't fully understand, but she knew that something bad was happening to Izuku, and she didn't like that. Eri stayed silent as the other kids voiced their outrage. Izuku had told her about him being corkless and that he had been picked on for it back when he was trying to get her to completely open up to him. He had also instructed her not to tell the rest of the children. He hadn't told her why, but to be fair, she didn't ask. And now they were finding out by themselves. They weren't completely right, but they seemed to be catching on and she didn't know what to do about it. So what do we do? Kay asked. Do about what? Their heads all spun towards the doorway and they saw Izuka standing there. He saw them looking at his notebooks and immediately got embarrassed. Oh, why you found those? Izuka stuttered, looking away in an attempt to hide his red face. I guess I forgot to throw those out. I just stopped getting in the habit of writing in those. Why would you want to throw these out? Fu asked, his face conveying his slight dissatisfaction. They? Izuka didn't know how to say it. They're not important anymore. Why? Fu asked. Well, I wrote them back when I still wanted to be a pro hero, Izuku explained. Now I don't need them anymore. You wanted to be a pro hero? Kiba asked, finally getting some information on her caretaker. Yes. Izuka winced. It still hurt to talk about. Why did you stop wanting to be one? Kiba asked him. Izuku opened his mouth, but nothing came out as his mind searched for something to say. But he found nothing. He didn't like the idea of lying to these kids, but he couldn't tell them the truth either. If he said it's because he couldn't, then they would ask why then he would have to bring up his corklessness. And he really, really didn't want to do that. His corklessness is what got him bullied in school, what kept him from making friends, what made people look at him with disgust. The hopeful part of his brain told him that the kids would accept him that everything would be the same. But the fearful, paranoid part of his brain made him worried. That they would reject him. The thought of receiving those same mocking, disgusted glances from these kids. He wouldn't be able to take that. It's not impotent. Izuka said, nearly shouting. Alarming the kids who rarely ever heard him raise his voice. It's in the past, it doesn't matter. The kids looked at Izuku's face. He was sweating and his breathing had picked up a little. And his eyes, they seemed, scared. There was a long pause. I'm sorry. Izuku composed himself, ready to put on his I'm fine act. Let's just go and dash. Is it because someone took your quirk? Kiba asked. Izuku froze. 
Fu gave her a pointed look. He wanted to find out more as well, but it was clear that this was painful to talk about. There was another pause, this one even longer than the last one. Izuka gave them a pained expression. He couldn't hide it anymore. It was now or never. No one stole my quirk. I was, I was born without a quirk. All the kids' eyes widened with the exception of Eri who looked ashamed. But everyone has a quirk. Kay said. Not everyone. Izuka corrected her. There is a very, very small amount of people in the world without a quirk. Most of them are old, but there is an even smaller amount of people my age without a quirk. So you just never had a quirk? Fu asked. Izuka nodded, looking at the floor. Everyone stayed silent. Izuka grit his teeth in anticipation. He hadn't felt so fearful of a response since he asked All Might if he could be a hero. And the answer to that question nearly broke him. After a while, Kiba eventually asked, Why didn't you tell us? I, I was afraid of what would happen if I told you. Izuku admitted, When people find out I'm quirkless, they don't treat me the same. They laugh at me, they hate me, they, they, I was scared that, if you found out, you wouldn't want to be with me anymore. There was another pause. This time a very short pause. That's stupid. Kiba shouted, alarming everyone. Listen here, caretaker. Your lack of quirk matters not to us. And anyone who would treat such a kind person poorly is an enemy of the great Kiba. You took me and my minion in. You gave us food and a home when no one else would. And you have done so to the rest of my siblings. You are our caretaker. And we will forever respect you. Yay. Sanson agreed. We'd never want to leave you, Izuku, Fu said. Our lives have gotten a lot better since we met you and not having a quirk doesn't really change that. You're just as great without a quirk as you are with one. Kay said. Eri gave him a determined nod. Izuku felt joy and relief fill him. They hadn't rejected him. Finally, someone hadn't rejected him. He fell to his knees and tears fell from his eyes. It felt like a weight had been lifted from his back. Sensing this was the time for a hug, Sanson extended her arms, encompassing Izuku and all the kids before bringing them all together in a tight embrace. Thank you. Izuka sobbed. Thank you all. Izuka smiled happily as he watched his children eat his food with such glee. It filled him with joy to see them all so happy eating what he made. There was Kay, the child he had saved from a villain. Her happy-go-lucky personality, love of puns, and sheer contagious happy energy made her a joy to be around. Even if some of her puns could be a bit cringy. Fu, his only son, was a bit boring but he was always very mindful of his siblings and father. He was smart, curious, and took after Izuku's habit of taking down notes of people's quirks. His quirk may have made him a bit gross at times, but that wasn't his fault and no one here begrudged him for it. Kiba was his most troublesome daughter as her egotistical and silly personality combined with her immense strength caused her to get into trouble way more often than the other children. But she always meant well and was rather endearing despite her ego making it hard to stay mad at her forever. Sanson can't really eat anything so she was just in front of the TV. This time she was watching a hero fight on the news, eagerly trying to recreate the moves she saw on screen. It was really cute, even if he was always nervous she would break something. Then there were his two biological daughters, Eri and Izumi. Izumi had light pink hair and purple eyes and was about six years old, the youngest out of all Izuku's kids. She did get Izuku's freckles though, other than that she looked really nothing like him. He shook his head. He felt like something was wrong for some reason. However, he didn't have time to think about that however as Eri and Izumi suddenly ran into his legs. He looked down and saw the two smiling brightly at him. Carry us. Izumi giggled. Please. Eri smiled brightly at him. Izuku was glad that he had started working out as he was able to more easily pick up the two small children. Are you too excited to move soon? He asked the two of them. He was a bit nervous about how the two of them would feel about the move. After all, these two had spent their entire lives here. However, his fears were realized as the two of them nodded eagerly. How big is it gonna be? Are we gonna have a pool? Is our room gonna be big? Izumi seemed extremely excited. Her excited questions were stopped by a tired yawn coming from her mouth. Izuka chuckled. It's going to be very big. And we'll have lots of rooms. Izumi was bursting with excitement. And Eri seemed happy as well. Are you two gonna miss this place though? We have spent a while here? Izuku asked. Nope. Izumi gave him a blank stare and paused for a moment. Oh yeah. I'm a really sad. About that. Eri thought about the question. 
She had spent all of her life here and yet, she felt no real attachment. She remembered being here all her life, but when she tried to remember details about this place past a certain point, it got hard. Eri clutched her head in pain. Eri, are you okay? Izuku asked, looking at her with concern. Why yes, Eri said as the headache alleviated. Izumi was also concerned, but she seemed more nervous than concerned. Izumi quickly shifted moods however and gave a bright smile to Izuku. Daddy, we got all the points, remember? You promised you would take us to the amusement park. Of course I remember. I would never forget all the hard work you guys did. Izuku looked at them all, pride and happiness bursting from his eyes. I'm so proud you all managed to get so many points before we even moved out. Ha! Huh. Of course, we did. The great Kiba and her siblings will surpass any and all expectations. Kiba laughed proudly. Weren't you the only person to lose points? Fu reminded her, making her stop and hang her head in shame of that memory. And we also got one sibling so that probably helped. G-Y-O. Sanson added, raising her fist high into the air. We all worked super hard. I can even read books all by myself. Kay puffed out her chest proudly, her snakes looking particularly smug. I didn't know snakes could look smug. Izumi thought, giving a small yawn. My family is weird. But they're mine, all mine. You've been putting in a lot of effort to Eri. Izuka patted Eri's head. One day you have full control over your quirk. Eri wanted to be confident that, but for some reason, she wasn't. And she couldn't quite understand why. She didn't normally doubt herself, but for some reason, she felt like she did. Ah! The headache was back again, Eri pushed her head into Izuku's chest. Izuku was now really concerned. Eri, are you feeling okay today? My my hurt a little. It's gone. Eri said. Are you sick, sis? Izumi asked her. Eri sick? Kei immediately got up and ran over to Izuku. If Eri's sick then we should probably go another day, Fu suggested. Sansan nodded very intensely in agreement. Kiba didn't say anything. She really wanted to go to the amusement park but if Eri was sick it would be more important for them to stay home until she was better. I'm fine. Eri initiated. She didn't want the trip delayed because of her. She would ask them to go without her but she knew that they would never do that. Izuku felt her forehead. No fever. He thought real hard about this. He could delay it, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. He looked at the kids. They would all be really disappointed though and he hated the idea of disappointing them. As he looked over them his eyes landed on Izumi. And he noticed something. Her eyes had bags. Very noticeable bags. He didn't know how he didn't see them before. Izumi, did you sleep last night? Izuku asked her, giving her a stern look. Her eyes widened in panic and realization and she nervously looked for an answer. Ayamaya. She does seem kinda tired, Fu noted. I am not. Izumi glared at the zombie boy. However, her point was rendered moot by another yawn coming out of her mouth. Izuka gave her a stern look. Izumi, I told everyone to go to sleep early last night. I am sorry, daddy. Izumi gave him an overdramatic teary-eyed look that would only work on a sap. Fortunately, Izuku was very much a sap and his stern look faded away almost instantly. Well, I need to postpone the trip to tomorrow anyway. Be but I'm fine. Eri protested. Her eyes teared up a little. Why am I crying? I don't cry a lot be but it f feels like ah. Uh. Another headache pulsed through Eri's head. She tried not to let it show but it was hard for her not to wince in pain and in the end Izuku noticed. You and Izumi are going to bed. Your health is more important than the trip. Izuka looked to the other children. Right? Yeah. Eri is important. Kay nodded. Sanson held up a flashcard saying in crude print, Get well, Eri. Rest, dear sister. I have infinite patience and hey, don't laugh. Kiba shouted to Fu who was trying and failing not to laugh at her saying she had infinite patience. We'll go once the headaches stop, Izuka said. Hopefully they'll stop later today so we can go tomorrow. And if you still feel them tomorrow then we'll see a doctor. Eri nodded. I'm sorry. It's okay, sis. I'll stay with you. Izumi gave Eri a kind smile and held her hand firmly. Eri smiled at her sister and Izuka walked to the bedroom. Once Izuka got in there he laid the two of them down on his bed and tucked them in. You two get some rest, I'll be right over there reading and doing some exercise. Izuku was about to move away but Izumi grabbed his shirt. You're not gonna stay. Izumi asked him, panic laced within her voice. I'm just gonna be right there, Izuka said pointing to the desk that was literally five feet away. Izumi continued to give him that teary-eyed, begging look. Izuka sighed. 
I need to keep working and studying so that way I can take care of you guys the best I can. Izumi's expression faltered for a second. He's always thinking about his kids. He's perfect. Izumi thought. However, it didn't take long for her expression to go back the same teary eye one, begging for him to lay down with them. Daddy. Eri looked away slightly. I want you to sleep with us too. Izuka looked at the two of them and then back to the books. And then he sighed. Let me just get a book to read and I'll lay down, Izuka said coming up with a compromise. Thank you, daddy. Izumi grinned, staring at Izuku with a look of pure admiration. Izuka tussled her hair, making her giggle. She was a handful, but any trouble she caused was more than worth it to see her smile. He grabbed a book labeled Advanced Court Counseling and then prepared to lay down. Can I be in the middle? Izumi asked, moving over so Izuka could be on the side. I want to hug Big Sis too. Izuka looked at Eri, who in response hugged Izumi and gave Izuku a nod saying he was okay with it. He crawled into bed and felt Izumi immediately pull him in closer, latching onto both him and Eri and holding them tight. Izumi was in paradise, sleeping next to her father and her slightly older sister, getting hugged by that sister as her father gently strokes both their heads. It was everything she could ever want. Everything she had dreamed of. Sniff. Eri opened her eyes and Izuka tore his attention from his book and turned to Izumi. Tears started leaking from her eyes and Izumi started crying into Izuku and Eri's arms. Daddy? Big sis? You love me, right? Izumi asked tearfully, right? Of course we do, Izuka said instantly. Yes, Eri said almost as fast, hugging her sister a bit closer to her. We love our siblings more than anything else in the world, Izuka said, soothingly rubbing the back of her head. Izumi leaned into their embraces. It was real. It was all here. They loved her. They cared for her. They wanted her here. Her eyes started to close. She was really tired. After all, she had been busy all of last night. Her eyes closed and she fell asleep. Meanwhile with the other kids, Fu, Kiba, Kei, and Sanson were playing superhero bash together on the couch, or rather Kiba was fighting a Fu and Kei who teamed up to fight against her. While Sanson just ran around throwing random attacks and off-staging herself because she didn't really know how to play the game. I grabbed her. Fu, use your ultimate. Kei shouted. Damn death arms and his absurd grab range. Kiba growled as she button mashed to try and escape. Fu activated his ultimate attack with Hawks, hitting both Edge Shot and Death Arms. After a short cinematic, both characters were sent flying off-screen. Curses! Kiba shouted, throwing her controller. The controller flew out and hit one of the boxes, knocking it over and breaking the controller. Kiba's eyes widened in panic. Oh no, oh no, oh no. She ran over to the fallen box and picked up the broken controller. Dad is gonna be so mad. Kiba dropped her usual persona. For the controller or for the pictures? Fu asked. Pictures? Kiba looked up and saw the box had opened up and the picture frames had spilled out. Ah hey! Kiba quickly picked up the box and started putting back the frames into the box. Fu paused the game and went over to help and started looking at the pictures when he noticed something odd and picked up a certain picture. What are you doing? We need to put these away. Kiba snatched the picture. Wait look at that picture, Fu said. Kiba looked at the picture. It was a picture they had all taken after they got Sanson. Their first group hug, Sanson was wrapped around all of them like a gooey rubber band while Izuka held up the camera trying to get the best shot. However, something was off. Izumi wasn't in it. Kiba looked at the picture in confusion. She remembered Izumi being in that photo. So, why wasn't she actually in it? Fu was equally confused. Why ah? Uh? Kiba suddenly dropped the picture as a massive headache hit her like a truck. Kiba what's dash, Fu stopped as he suddenly felt strange. Something was happening in his head. Kiba. Kei and Sanson immediately got off the couch and ran towards the vampire girl in pain. Goo. Sanson moved around Kiba trying to see what was hurting her. Meanwhile, in their minds, something changed. Their memories of taking the picture now matched up with the picture itself. Kiba's headache stopped and the girl groaned in pain. What was that? Izumi was never in that picture. Fu realized. You remember it now too. Kiba gave him a pointed look. How is it you didn't suffer from a headache like I did? Probably because I can't feel pain. Fu guessed. He put his thumb to his lips and got into a thinking stance. Izumi wasn't in that picture. So why did we remember her being in it? Also, why did Kiba have a huge headache before she could remember it, right? What are you talking about? 
Kay asked, totally confused. You recall our first group embrace when Sanson first arrived, correct? Kiba asked Kay while she picked up the photo. Yeah, it was great. It was like being covered in jelly. Kay chirped. Sanson was evidently happy to hear this and wrapped her in a hug, making the two of them giggle. And you remember Azumi being in the picture, right? Kiba asked her. Aha, uh -huh, Kay replied. Well, she's not, Kiba revealed the picture, allowing both Kay and Sanson to get a good look. The two of them looked confused for a while. Before Kay suddenly got the same headache Kiba did, Sanson just blankly stared at the photo for half a minute before looking confused again. After about the same amount of time Kay's headache stopped. Wah. Huh? Why? Kay was so confused. Something's definitely wrong, Fu said. Did your memory change too? Kay asked Sanson. The good girl nodded. But she didn't get a headache either. I guess it doesn't happen to people who can't feel pain. Fu summarized. But for people who can, they get headaches whenever their memories. Wait, Eri. Eri? Kiba and Kay said at the same time as all three girls gave him a confused look. Eri was getting a lot of headaches today, remember? Fu reminded them. Oh, right? Do you think that had something to do with this? Kiba asked. Probably, Fu said. We should ask her when she wakes up. I can't wait that long. Kiba objected. There is something afoot in our home. Our minds are under attack. We cannot waste a single second. If we wake up, Ariazuka's gonna give you a disappointed look, Kay told her. Never mind, we shall wait. Kiba said almost instantly. In the meantime, let us see what clues we can find on our own, shall we? Yeah. Fu agreed. Maybe we should look at more pictures. A few hours later, Izuka walked out of his room as quietly as he could, not wanting to wake either of his daughters up. He looked at his watch. It's going to get late. It's a shame we couldn't go to the park today. Maybe I should go make some special snacks for them. I'll need to go to the supermarket to get the ingredients, though. As Izuki walked into the living room, he saw that of the picture frames he had packed up had been taken out of the box and were being looked at by the other kids. What are you doing? Izuka asked them. Izuku. Kay ran up to him holding a picture. Izuka looked at the picture. It was a picture that he, Izumi, Eri, and Kay had taken when they sold food in the park. Except, Izumi wasn't in it. What? Izuka took the picture from Kay. But, Izumi was in this I remember a. A headache suddenly hit Izuku as his memory repaired itself. Look at this too. Kiba brought out a few more photos that Izumi was mysteriously absent from. The pain in Izuku's head increased as his memory rearranged itself to make sense of what he was seeing. W. What's going on? Izuka groaned, clutching his head. I don't know, Fu said, but I think something may be wrong with our memories. Some dastardly villain might be controlling our minds, Kiba suggested. Izuka wasn't sure about that, but it was clear something was wrong, and that it probably involved a quirk. What's strange to Izuku is that none of the other kids seem to be missing from photos they should be in. Just Izumi. And he didn't know why that was. For a second, just a split second, he suspected Izumi herself may have something to do with this. However, he quickly dismissed that thought. Izumi was his daughter. There's no way she would do anything bad to them. Besides, she was quirkless. Just like he was. There was no way she could have done this. He pulled out his phone and quickly called the police. Hello, this is the police. What is your emergency? The person on the other end said. Yes, this is Midoriya Izuku. I think me and my family are under the effect of some kind of mental quirk. Izuka said. We started looking at pictures and found that one of our family members dash. Wait, you said your name was Midoriya Izuku? The person on the other end said. Yes, Izuku confirmed. Okay, give me a second. The person said. Suddenly the phone bleeped. And then after a few seconds, a new and very familiar voice picked up. Hey there, Izuku old buddy, what's up? Asked the voice of Naomi. Naomi. Izuku asked in confusion, then he remembered anything that might concern the safety of the children was to be reported to the OBCC. Oh, sorry. I forgot I was supposed to report to your branch, but um, are you the only person that works for the OBCC? I've never met anyone else who works there except you. Yeah, you see, after you took an airy, you found K so fast I didn't get a chance to leave the city and was the closest agent available. Same goes for the other kids. Now I just got promoted as the connection between you and the OPCC so you're gonna be hearing a lot from me. The Eri incident? Izuka had no idea what she was talking about. Yeah. When you saved Eri from the Yakuza and then adopted her. 
Naomi said in a confused tone, wondering why she had to remind him of this. Yakuza? Adoption? Aries, my biological daughter. What her dash, Izuka stopped. Wait, if our memories are being affected then, ah. Another headache hit Izuku, this time much harder than the last one. But this time, instead of his memory being fixed, it just became foggy. What's going on? Aries, my daughter, right? My biological daughter? Izuku was even more confused. Biological Izuku, there is no way you've had sex with anyone at your current age, let alone when you were in grade school, Naomi told him. What's sex? Izuku felt like he heard of that before and part of him felt embarrassed by saying it. Izuku, are you pranking me? You're pranking me, right? Naomi asked him. And no. I think something's happened to our memories. We started looking at some pictures and we noticed Izumi wasn't there dash, Izuka got cut off. Izumi? Who the hell is Izumi? Naomi asked. My other biological daughter. Eri's sister. Izuka answered. Okay, again. Izuka, you have no biological daughters and you've never taken in anyone named Izumi. Naomi said. I'm sending some people over to you now. Would you mind describing whoever the hell this Izumi kid is? She's a, she's got pink hair and purple eyes dash. Izuku was interrupted again. She had pink hair and purple eyes and you thought she was directly related to you. Naomi deadpanned. Yeah, I think she gets it from her mom, Izuka said. And that is? Naomi asked. I can't remember them, Izuka answered. Izuka could feel his head hurting again. Okay, Izuku. I want you to look up how babies are made, then think about if you really have any biological daughters. Naomi said. One Google search later. Izuku's face was pale as he finished reading about it. What's worse is that as he had read it, the memories of learning about it came back to him. Meaning he had to learn about the birds and bees twice. I know I didn't do that. With anyone. But that means that suddenly it hit Izuku. This headache wasn't nearly as long, but it hit Izuku like a bullet. Causing him to pass out as memories swirled and changed in his head. Hours later. Oh. Izuku groaned. He opened his eyes and saw Naomi's deadpanned face staring at him. You really couldn't wait until you got the bigger house? She asked him. Her deadpan broke and gave way into an amused smile. I really think you have some sort of secret quirk that attracts children. What? What do you dash? Then it all came back to him. I don't have any biological daughters. No shit. Naomi chuckled. Izuka looked around and saw he was still in his house, in the living room, on his couch. He saw a bunch of agents in his kitchen raiding his fridge. I'm guessing those are your friends? Izuka sighed. Yup. You're rich. You can take us raiding your fridge. Naomi said, taking out one of the lollipops he had for the kids and sucking on it. I remember everything now, Izuka said. Yeah, turns out all your memories were altered by that girl, Naomi said. We had our specialist fix your noggin, so you're welcome. That girl, Izumi. Izuka realized. Izumi had never shown up until today and then suddenly all their memories included her. Yeah, that's not her real name, Naomi informed him. Her real name, Kyoku Omoid. And as you can guess, she can alter memories. She's six, coming up on seven, and she's actually not an orphan for once. She has two parents and an older sister. Okay. This was a lot to take in. A small child had broken into his house and changed not only his memory, but the memory of his entire family, except his mom who was out at the time and inserted herself into their lives. Then he remembered something. When they laid down and she started crying, begging for them to say they loved her and while clinging to them. Why did she do all this? Izuka had a bad, bad feeling about what the girl's motivation might be. Oh, we don't know. Naomi shrugged. When we came in, she absolutely lost her shit. She started crying and screaming hysterically, so much to the point where it scared the other children and some of my guys and me. It was really depressing to look at, too. Our guys have been trying to get her to talk to her for a while, but she's not cooperating. Think you can give us a hand? Izuka nodded and Naomi led him to his mother's room which had two guards in front of it. The guards moved aside and let the two of them in. Inside, sitting on his mother's bed, was Kyoku, sobbing into her hands. When she heard the door open her head shot towards it. Once she saw Izuka she immediately dashed towards him, hugging his legs. Please don't get rid of me. She begged. Please. I'm sorry I mess with your memory. I, I just wanted a family. Instantly Izuka kneeled down and hugged her, stunning the girl. I'm not mad at you, Izuka said to her. Just tell us everything. You everything? She asked. Everything. Why you did this? How you did this? Everything. 
Izuka told her, sounding both serious and affectionate. I. The girl paused, looking rather squeamish. My family doesn't like me, daddy always tells me to go away and gets angry when I don't, and mommy is always, not there, in the head. Big sister hates me too. Most of the time they all just ignore me. W when I got my quirk, I tried to make them love me. But my quirk can't change someone like that. They just remembered everything and punished me. Neglectful family guess I'll have to get legal on the line. Naomi sighed. Izuka would have been amazed that Naomi actually sounded kind of professional, but his attention was focused purely on the girl. He had feared that her family was neglectful or abusive the minute Naomi mentioned she had a family. Izuku could guess her motivation from here. T then I saw you. And your family. I saw how much you loved them and and cared for them and I, I wanted it so bad. Kyoka sobbed. So I erased my old family's memories. And then I changed Kiba's memories so she would leave the door unlocked at night and I snuck in and changed your memories. So that's how she got in. She must have ambushed Kiba when we went to the park or something. Izuka speculated. Well, you did kind of a sh bad job. I mean they broke out of it pretty quickly. Naomi criticized her. It's not my fault. It takes me a long time to change that many memories. And I had to change Ari's whole past. Kyoka defended herself, pouting while flailing her arms. If it takes her a while then she might have spent all night doing it. That would explain why she was so tired. Izuku thought. But. Why did you change so many of Ari's memories? Izuku asked her. Kyoku froze and her face turned pale. I, when I use my quirk, I can look through memories. So when I W went to change Aries' memories, I, I saw everything. Izuku paled as well and hugged the girl closer. No child should have to see that. I, I, why, I, 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 it was horrible. Kyoka sobbed. I didn't want her to remember it, so I, I changed it. Yeah, that's reasonable. Part of me wishes we didn't fix her memory, but we're complied to by contract, so yeah. But if you want to erase all that stuff from her noggin later, then that's up to you. Naomi said. Izuka contemplated that before quickly pushing it to the back of his mind. He could think about that later. Right now he had to worry about the girl in front of him. Ieri had gone through so much. I wanted her to be happy. Kyoku admitted. So I changed everything. But I didn't have enough time, I didn't have enough time for everyone as so I rushed. That explains why we were able to realize it so quickly, Izuka muttered. Why eh? You don't realize your memory changed unless you see something that proves it. Kyoku explained. So her quirk stays in effect until the victim witnesses and contradicts the false memories she creates. So if the photos hadn't been there or if she had more time to alter our memories, then we might have never realized something was off. Izuka thought. So that explains some things. But why did you get rid of Izuka's memories of what sex is? Naomi asked. Naomi. Izuka moved to cover the girl's ears. What? If she got rid of your memory of sex, she probably already knows what sex is. She probably figured it out from looking at her parents' memories. Naomi protested, crossing her arms and pouting like a child. Jeez. Kyoka looked away, her face turning red from embarrassment. I, I wanted to be his real daughter, but I knew that I couldn't do that if he knew where babies came from, so I erased it. Ah. So you got greedy and instead of settling for being an adopted kid, you went for the biological route. Naomi said before getting lightly elbowed by Izuku, who glared at her fiercely. Now is not the time to criticize her, Izuku whispered slash growled. Naomi put her hands up defensively and backed away. Izuku looked back at Kyoku who was crying fiercely. I am sorry I really wanted someone to love me. Kyoku cried. Izuku's heart ached and he pulled the girl into a tiger hug. I'm sorry. Kyoku froze for a second before looking at Izuku with confusion. WH what? Why are you sorry? I'm sorry that you felt like you needed to make someone love you, Izuku explained. No child should have to feel that way. I'll give you all the love you want. So you don't have to do something like that even again. Kiyoka's eyes were wide with shock. She knew he was nice, but she never would have expected him to be this nice. Once the shock dispersed, the only things left were tears. Tears for having finally found someone who loves her. Tears for it having taken so long. Tears for all the things she's been through and tears for the fact that it was all over. And so she cried into his chest while he lovingly patted her back. It's okay. Cry for as long as you need. Izuka told her. Meanwhile, Naomi had been making some phone calls while this was all happening. She walked up to Izuku and tapped his shoulder, getting his attention. So I made some calls. We've sent some people to her parents' household. 
Right now we're starting a case against them for child neglect. During the duration of the case and following legal action, she'll be under the care of OPCC and as per our contract, under your care. And when we are finished assuming we win, which is basically guaranteed, she will be permanently removed for their custody and placed into yours. Naomi explained. Izuka nodded, happy to hear that however there was one thing that confused him. You labeled her as an OPSI that quickly? Well, it likely would have taken longer if it wasn't for her little display, Naomi told him. She, a six-year-old, used her quirk to make her parents forget about her and inserted herself into a whole new family while altering several other things in people's memories and one girl's entire life all within the span of one night. Imagine what she could do with more experience or more time. Izuka thought about what Naomi said. Kyoku was very young and inexperienced, but she was still able to break into his house and mess with the minds of six people in a relatively short amount of time. Ari's personality even changed due to her not remembering past traumas that haunted her. She could in theory change people's entire lives in an instant or even change how they act and what they do. It was an extremely dangerous quirk if in the wrong hands. And therefore the government wanted to make sure it was in the right hands. Not that it mattered to him much. He would have probably tried to adopt her. Dad? Getting used to a new addition to the family had become much easier for Zuku. It helped that Azuka still recalled many of the false memories Kyoka gave him, giving him a general idea of how she was and how she acted, or at least how she perceived herself and how she acted. However, there was one thing Azuka had not gotten used to. Ah, daddy, you're too good at this game. Kyoka pouted as her character in Superhero Bash flew off screen. Azuka flinched slightly, and his body tensed up. He still wasn't used to being referred to as a father. He was still 15 after all, far too young for fatherhood in his opinion. At first, he had just let it go, wondering if she would stop referring to him as her father if they lived together, but that wasn't the case it seemed. Izuka's character was blasted off-screen by Sanson's character while he was distracted. They were all playing together as a family, even Inko decided to join in with the chaotic eight-player bash, and all the kids had teamed up against Izuku and Inko. Get ya? Sanson fist-bumped everyone, making several arms out of her body to fist-bump everyone at once. Don't get too confident, children, Inko said, immediately stopping their celebration by knocking out two of them at once. As Izuku's only friend and parent, she had gotten very used to this game series. Most people were too wrapped up in the game to notice Izuku's behavior, however Fu, as one not to get wrapped up in things, did see him react, and wanted to try something. As Azuka got in on his next stock, Fu decided to try something. Try dodging this, Dad, Fu said as he moved his character to attack Azuku. After being called Dad, Izuku flinched and got hit by the extremely telegraphed attack. This odd behavior caught the attention of the other kids and Inko. Izuku, are you okay, honey? Inko asked him. Am I am fine? Izuka stuttered. Are you really okay, Dad? Fu asked him. Izuku flinched again, causing him to randomly attack the air. Seeing the pattern, Kiba decided to try it out next. Dad, I'm about to attack you. Kiba shouted out loud. Izuku panicked and dodged too soon, causing him to get hit. Ah, I see, referring to caretaker as father seems to freak him out and cause him to panic, Kiba said, before realizing what she just said. Wait, what? You don't like it when we call you dad? K looked at him curiously. Why? W-L, I mean you know. Izuka began to nervously sweat. I'm not really sure why you want me to be your father figure and I thought I was more of a big brother figure. All the kids gave Izuku a confused look. But you are our dad. Fu pointed out as if it's the most obvious thing in the world. As the man who takes care of us and provides for us that makes you our adopted father, Kiba said matter-of-factly. I'm not sure why this flusters you so much. Why well, what? Izuku was in shock. He knew that Kyoka thought of him as her father, but all of them did? But wait only Kyoku ever calls me dad. The rest of you normally just say my name or call me a nickname. I refer to you as caretaker as it is your title, you take care of children. It is only respectful that I refer to by your title or as father. I simply choose to refer to you by title. Kiba explained. I wasn't fully comfortable thinking of you as my dad at first, but after I got used to it I had already been calling you by your first name, Fu said. Dada. Sanson moved herself onto his lap. I thought you liked being called Azuku, so I just called you that, Kay explained. But I still always thought you were my dad now. You're a lot more like a dad than my other one. 
I, I always wanted you to be my dad, Eri said quietly. I just want a dad who loves me. Kyoka said. Izuka wanted to point out how he was too unqualified, too young, too, him. Well, I suppose that makes me a grandmother now. Inko gave a small giggle in amusement. Mom. Izuka gave her a betrayed look. She was legally the parent here. Even if she wasn't around much. Then it struck him. He looked at the faces of the kids, his kids. He had been the one taking care of them and while his mother did bring in lots of cash, he was also bringing in income and providing for them. He taught them, made sure they were safe, comforted them when they needed it and showed them in affection. And at the end of the day, they just wanted a parent who would do all that for them. Not an older brother, a parent. But can I be that for them? I'm, I'm just a Deku. Izuka doubted himself. But if I don't do it, no one will. Mom's too busy to be that parent for them like she was for me and even if she wasn't I couldn't ask her to. I'm the one who agreed to take care of them. So I have to take responsibility. If they want me to be their father, then I have to do everything I can to be the best father I can be. Okay, Izuka said, taking all this in as best he could. The idea still made him uneasy, but he was determined now. I guess I'm a dad now. I wonder if I can change some of the paperwork. Soon enough the kids went back to the game, however, Inko was distracted by proudly looking at her son, trying not to cry. My baby, look at how you've grown. She thought. A new life? Izuka looked at the two children in front of him. Kyoku and Eri. So, uh, Izuka wasn't sure how to propose this question. Eri, do you remember that fake life Kyoka gave you? Eri nodded. For the most part, the kids had forgiven Kyoka after she apologized seeing as most of them could sympathize with her rather easily. However, Eri had been different after her memories came back. She had been quieter and a bit more out of it, staring off into the distance randomly and not hearing when someone was calling her. It's like she was somewhere else. So, how do you feel about it? Izuku asked. There was a long, long pause. I wish it were real. Eri started to cry. Don't cry, big sis. Kyoku immediately got out of her seat to comfort her. Kyoka had immediately taken to Eri, mainly out of pity for the horrible, horrible life she lived. She always tried to comfort her and protect her and make her feel happy. It was very sweet in Izuku's opinion. But with Eri, it was as Izuku feared. She didn't want her memories back. She wanted her fake life instead. Don't worry, big sis. I'll just replace your memories again. Kyoku was about to put her hands on Eri's head to activate her quirk, but Izuka stopped her. Daddy? Kyoka gave Izuku a confused look. We can't just replace her entire life with a fake one, Izuku told her. W.I.? Kyoka got a bit upset. She saw that her sister was suffering and wanted to help really, really badly. Eri was also curious as to why Izuka stopped her. When it came to tough decisions that involved his kids, Izuka had one way of doing it. He thought back to his own life and tried to either compare points of his life to theirs or put himself in their shoes. Back after All Might told him he couldn't be a hero. He hid away in his room, staying away from everyone else. When life got tough, he ran away. Until life caught up to him and gave him a new purpose. Now his life was much better. He had a goal, one he could reasonably achieve. He was helping people All Might had even claimed they were friends. But did that mean he should forget his old one? He could. He was moving soon and it's not like he would need to see any of his old classmates or teachers again. Even Kakin. If we wanted to, he could just erase his past and embrace his future. But if he did that, would he still be the same person? In these kids, he saw a bit of himself. Someone who was rejected by others for something they couldn't control. If he forgot that part of himself, would he still look at them the same way? Of course, he was sure he would still love them all, but would he be able to relate to them as well? Would he have felt the need to agree to take care of an unknown but almost certainly large amount of children just because he knew how it felt to finally be accepted after years of being scorned by others? Perhaps it was wrong to compare his life to Ares considering the things he had been through paled when compared to the things she endured but it was his only point of reference. He would make the decision he thought would best serve her. As he always would. I'm not a psychologist, but I do know that embracing a fake reality isn't healthy, Izuka told her. People only become stronger after they've gone through bad things. And I know that Eri one day will become stronger than any of us. Why you really think that? Eri asked him tearfully. Izuka smiled at her and embraced the two. Of course. There was a short pause before Izuku added. But at the same time no one should have to deal with what Eri went through. So Kyoku I would like to ask you to erase some of Eri's memories. 
just some of the stuff that Overhaul did to her and a few other things. Kyoka seemed nervous. She had never done anything that specific before. Can you help me? Of course, Suzuku told her. Kyoka looked at Eri. She didn't relish the idea of looking back into Eri's memories. It was dark and horrible in there. But her family accepted her in even after she used her quirk on them, so she had to do what she could for her family. She placed her hands on Eri's head and their work began. Where does it go? Has she always been doing this? How did I never notice this? Fu thought his eyes transfixed on a peculiar sight. Kay was eating. Or rather, she was feeding one of her snakes an egg. It was mesmerizing in a way, watching that snake swallow the egg. But it brought to mind one question. Fu got up from the couch where he and Sanson were watching TV and walked up to Kay. Where does that go? Where does what go? Kay asked in return. The egg? If your snake eats something, where does it go? Fu clarified. Kay looked at him, blinked, blinked again, and then said, Izuku. The two of them ran towards Izuku's room and saw him studying with Kyoku and Eri also studying in the room. Oh, did you two need something? Izuku asked, looking away from his mental health guidebook. When I feed my snakes, where does it go? Kay asked him enthusiastically. Well, you see, all your snakes are connected to one tube in your body, and that tube goes down your neck, through your body, and into your stomach. So technically, you have two ways of eating. Izuku informed her. Wow, Izuku, you sure know a lot. You're a real egghead. Kay giggled. She was eating eggs, wasn't she? Izuku asked, giving the two an unimpressed look. Yes. Fu sighed. I can't feel pain, but her puns hurt me. At least you weren't in her head. Do you know how many puns I saw in there? Kyoka said. Well, to be fair, those were only for Memomi to see. Kay snickered. Kay, I'm going to buy you a joke book. Please learn from it. Izuka deadpanned. Bad words. Fuck. Kyoka said after stubbing her toe on the living room table. Izuku, who was cooking with one of his mother's aprons on, eyes widened and alarm bells rang in his head. He immediately turned off the stove and ran towards Kyoku. Don't say that word. Izuka shouted. EAP. Kyoku was alarmed by how loud his voice was. Sorry. Izuku apologized. But you can't say that word. W-I? Kyoku wasn't one to argue with her family and Izuku especially, she just wanted to know what about that word made him react like that. After all, she saw her parents use it plenty of times in their memories and he saw the evil blonde-haired kid Kaken say it a lot in Izuku's memories. It's a really bad word, Izuku told her. You just shouldn't say it. Okay? Okay. Kyoku agreed. Am I in trouble? No, I'll let it go this time since you didn't know but I will be very upset and disappointed if you do it again. Izuku told her, seeing fear grow in her eyes. One of the things that made his job easier is that the only real punishment he needed to give most of them was just him being disappointed. And whatever you do, Izuku continued, you can't let any of your siblings hear you say dash. Fuck, came a familiar voice from the ceiling. The two of them froze and looked up on the ceiling to see Sanson stuck to it, looking down and smiling at them. Fuck. The slime girl repeated with a smile. There was a short pause before Izuku just sighed and facepalmed. Of course, that's one of the words she's able to understand easily. Secrets. No. Nah. No way. Kyoka refused. Izuku and Eri had gone on a walk. With Eri being the most introverted child here, Izuku felt he needed to make sure she went outside and got some sun every now and then. Kyoko was going to go with them, however, the rest of her siblings insisted that she stay. Why? Because since she looked into both Izuku and Eri's memories, she knew all their secrets. Why not? Kiba stomped her foot lightly on the floor, still making the floor creak and bend with her strength. Daddy made me promise not to tell anyone about what I saw in your memories without permission. Kyoko told them. And even if I could, you don't want to know what was in Eri's memories. Why? Is it really bad? Kay asked, looking concerned. She knew that Eri's life before meeting Izuku was rough and that some bad men used her for something bad. Like that guy who used her to rob places. But was it that much worse? We've all been through a lot of tough times. Fu pointed out. And we've all been through a lot of pain. What you've been through is nothing compared to Eri. Kyoka said seriously. It's bad. It's really bad. Even all the sad stories on TV aren't as bad as what happened to Eri. That actually surprised them, characters on TVs typically had really sad backstories. So if Aerie's backstory was really that bad, 
Kay frowned, her eyes growing anxious and concerned. Ari was the person who helped bring her into this family. The person who sympathized with her even after she used her quirk on Izuku. Her precious little sister. Izuku let me get rid of some of the bad memories, but she still has a lot of them. And a lot of the bad feelings. Kyoko nervously played with her hair. Izuka said that going through bad things can make you a lot stronger and that once the bad things are over you can make your life a lot better. Really? But if it's really, really bad shouldn't she just forget it? Kay asked. Yay. Sanson agreed. She didn't like it when her siblings were sad. If bad memories were hurting her then the bad memories should go away. What a foolish question, Kiba spoke out making everyone look at her. It is clear that the caretaker's wisdom is lost on you. What do you mean? Kyoku asked her. Simple. While my infinite resolve comes from countless eons of my everlasting life, the hardships I've been through have done nothing but harden my resolve. To forget those would be to lose a part of my own will. Kiba declared, that and it would lessen my gratitude for the things I have today. And that would be sacrificing today's happiness to forget yesterday's sadness. To put it in simpler, non-crazy terms, she's saying all the bad things she went through are the reason she's so determined today, Fu explained. And while I know it's kinda hard for me to relate to you, you know because it's harder for me to feel things. But I've felt bad about things before, really bad. Flashback. Get out! Shouted a woman as she threw Fu out the door of a house. Fu fell to the ground. And while he felt no physical pain, he was still crying. Mama no. Please. I am sorry. Fu begged for forgiveness. This is the second time you've bit someone. And you got your rotten body parts all over the floor. The woman Fuhai's mother shouted at him. I don't want a disgusting undead monster as a son. And are those tears? So have you just been pretending not to feel all this time? Get out. And never come back. Flashback end. Fu felt a small flash of pain bubble up inside him as he remembered that. But it was gone as fast as it came. But I learned things about myself after those and if I lose those memories then I don't learn anything, Fu said. Sanson, if you forgot all that time you spent in the jar, would you enjoy moving around and being free as much? Goo? Sanson thought hard about that question. She hated being in that jar. It was so boring and not being able to move much was a nightmare. She had been there so long she thought she was gonna be stuck there forever. And she was so happy and thankful when she finally got released. Now she always made sure to move around with the energy of a nuclear reactor. And Kay, would you be able to take it as well as you do when we point out that your jokes are garbage? Fu asked, letting go of the insult to her punning wit. Kay thought hard about that. A lot of people insulted her. Like, a lot of people. And eventually, she just learned to roll with the punches and was almost immune to it. It didn't offset how terrible she felt back then, but it was something positive she carried with her to this day. Bad things happen to us. And those things are over now. We must use those bad experiences to carve out a better future. Kiba said. After that rousing speech, the others started to understand a little. We should trust Izuku. Even if we don't understand what he's trying to do, we should trust he's always trying to help us. K determined. Kiyoka thought about that. While she had seen the horrors of Eri's memories, she had also seen Izuku's memories as well. She's seen just how brave he was saving Eri from that horrible man, how much time and energy he put into trying to help every single one of his kids. How kind and forgiving he'd been since he was young. Immediately she felt bad for showing even the slightest bit of doubt in her new father. Hey, if you can't tell us about Eri, what about Izuku? Kay asked. Kiyoka shook her head. He said not to say anything. But the pink-haired girl's fist clenched in anger, remembering what she saw in his memories. Eri's memories left her horrified and were the source of most of her current nightmares. But Izuku's memories just left her enraged. Logically speaking, Eri's memories should make her angrier, seeing as the things done to her were much worse. However, the small child couldn't view Overhaul as human. It didn't help that when she saw people's memories, she saw it through their perspective, meaning she only saw Overhaul through Eri's eyes. Making it easier to just think of Overhaul as a monster. A single monster that was stopped and had gotten what he deserved. The people that tormented Izuku were numerous and very human. She was infuriated that what seemed like the entire world hated Izuku for no other reason than he didn't have a quirk. Not one, not a single person tried to help him or do anything to stop the torment. Eri's memories had taught her what kind of monsters lurked outside. Izuka's memories taught her the world was cruel and her own memories and that of her siblings enforced this narrative. Daddy's strong too. 
Kyoka said in anger. And he's gonna keep getting stronger. Meanwhile, with Izuku and Eri, the two walked through the neighborhood taking a route that would deliberately avoid Bakugo's house. Izuka hasn't talked to Bakugo in a long, long time. And now that he was moving, it was possible that he may not talk to him for a while longer. It wasn't possible that they'd never see each other again. After all, Inko and Mitsuki were still good friends and kept in contact with each other. And he knew Bakugo signed up for Yue and had no doubt he was going to get in and become a hero, meaning he was probably going to see him on the news someday. But Izuku didn't have it in him to talk to him again. Every time he thought about it, bad memories came up that he had been working very hard to repress. One day he knew he and Bakugo would talk again. Hopefully when he was ready. Eri, Izuka said suddenly. Hmm? Eri responded, still keeping a tight grip on his hand as they walked. You're doing really well. Izuka praised her. You went outside with almost no hesitation this time. M. Eri nodded. Izuku? Yes, Izuka said. Do you like going outside? Eri asked him. Not, not really, Izuka answered honestly. Before I met any of you I stayed inside almost all the time. Then why do we go outside a lot? Eri asked. Well, there are a lot of things to do outside. You can go to the park, the arcade, go out to eat, and a lot more, Izuka said. And it's important to get some sunlight and fresh air. Eri paused for a moment to take in what he said before responding with. Then why didn't you like to go outside? Well, I wasn't the best at dealing with other people. Izuku explained, downplaying how those other people treated him. So I stayed inside to avoid them. There was a short pause before Eri continued. Kyoka said that everyone but our family are cruel and mean, Eri told him. Izuka blinked, shocked for about a second before he realized just how much sense that made. After all, her only experience with other people besides their family was her previous abusive family and all their memories, which mostly consisted of other people being terrible. I need to find her some friends, actually, not that I think about it. I should probably find all of them some friends outside the family. Izuka thought. Actually, considering my own lack of friends, I may need some help with that. Well, Kyoku has only really ever seen bad people outside our family. But there are good people. Like All Might. Izuka told her. Eri didn't respond. One day, you and everyone else will make friends and you'll all play together and be happy. Izuku continued. Eri kept quiet. If Izuka said that it would happen, then she had to believe him and try her best to be ready for that day. Izuka looked at the sight before him in disbelief. This. He had been taking an early morning jog how he managed to free himself from the dog pile of kids on top of him without waking them even he didn't know and found it had been raining. Still, no pain to gain, so he put on a raincoat and some boots and started running. However, during the middle of his jog through the park, he found something he really should have been expecting by now. In front of him was a small child, about six, with black hair, a pair of shorts, a white shirt, and a hat with two spikes on it collapsed in a bush. Immediately, Izuka looked around, wondering if the boy's parents were anywhere around. Of course, there was no one around. After making sure he wasn't kidnapping a child, he immediately scooped him up and ran towards his house. He's in bad shape, he's shivering a lot. How long was he out in that rain? And he looks like he hasn't eaten in a while, too. Izuka ran as fast as he could, he needed to get home so he could help this kid. The next day, Koda opened his eyes slowly, blinking at the light flooding his eyes. Ow. My body hurts. He groaned. His body was sore and moving even just a little was a strain on his little body. He looked around to the best of his ability and saw that he was in a bed. He was covered by blankets and there was an IV drip attached to his arm. Where am I? I passed out in the park. Did someone bring me to the hospital? This doesn't look like a hospital. Koda was confused and tired. So very tired. He closed his eyes, fading in and out of consciousness until eventually he gave in and passed out. There was nothing. Koda stood in a black void. The only things along with him were two body bags. Koda stared at the bags. His body frozen by the many emotions running through him. Anger. Sadness. Fear. Betrayal. He just stared at them for a while until his body moved forward. But he wasn't controlling it. Dread grew inside of him as he moved closer to the bags. No. Stop. Stop moving. Koda's body grabbed the zippers of the body bags and started opening them. Stop. Koda gasped and jolted upwards only to be met with pain. Ah. Koda fell back down onto the bed and started freaking out, moving around despite the pain, 
hyperventilating all the while. Mama. Papa. Kota cried, tears following down his face. Then, Blue Goose suddenly came from seemingly nowhere and moved on top of him, retaining his body and keeping him from moving. Sansons had formed right in front of Kota's face. Beef. After a while, Kota started breathing normally again. W where am I? Who are you? Kota asked, still panicking a little. Sanson. Sanson stated her name. Sanson? Is. Is that your name? Kota asked. Sanson nodded. Okay. Where am I? Kota repeated. Wom, Sanson answered. Wom? Where's Wom? Kota asked, confused by Sanson's way of talking. Where Sanson said. Where? Where what? Kota was getting a little frustrated at the lack of proper communication going on. She was also still wrapped around his body. Part of him wanted to tell her to get off, but she also, her cool slime did feel kinda nice on his sore fevered body. However, before things could go any further, the door opened and Izuka walked in with Eri and Kyoka behind him. You're awake, Izuka said in a relieved tone. I was worried you might not wake up. You were in really bad condition when I found you. Where am I? Koda asked impatiently. Annoyed at having to ask so many times as well as slightly fearful due to waking up in an unknown place. I'm sorry, you must be confused. Izuku apologized. I'm Izuka Midoriya. The girls you see are my, um, daughters. Kind of. Kota gave him a skeptical look. He may be very young, but even he knew that Izuku was way too young to have kids, especially this many. Lair? Kyoka gave Kota a vicious death glare. Daddy isn't a lair. It's okay, Kyoku, I would be skeptical if I was in his position too. Izuka tried to calm her before addressing Kota. I know it's hard to believe, but there's been some special circumstances that lead to this. Kota still gave him a distrustful look for a few moments before looking at Sanson. Oh, right? Sorry about her. I saw you were fussing in your sleep and the doctor said that you shouldn't move around too much so I told her to stay here and keep you from moving if you started thrashing. Izuku explained. Sanson, you can get off now. Good work. Sanson nodded and unwrapped herself from Kota's body and oozed over to Izuku, slithering up his body and winding around his neck like a scarf. I'd would gwood. Sanson rubbed her face against Izuku's cheek. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Izuka praised her while petting her head. And you're speaking so well today, too. You just need to learn to not use the W's so much. Kota stared at the four of them for a few seconds before deciding that now was the time to leave. He pushed himself up and immediately remembered the pain. Ah, didn't you hear him? You can't move, dummy. Kyoka scolded him. Kyoku, what have I said about name-calling? Izuka said sternly. I only called him a dummy. Kyoku defended. I could have called him a dash. One more word and that's ten points off, Izuka warned her. Kyoka promptly closed her mouth. Izuka turned back to Koda. But she is right. I told you not to move or you'll just get even sicker. You can't tell me what to do, Koda said defiantly, still glaring at Izuku while trying to move out of the bed. Sanson, sorry to ask you to do this again but can you keep him from moving? Izuka asked remorsefully. No pwop. Sanson gave him a thumbs up. The good girl then quickly moved over Kota, making several arms and moving Kota back onto the center of the bed, putting the covers back over him and keeping him from moving in one fell swoop. Hey. Kota protested. Let go. This is kidnapping. It's not really. Izuka sighed. While you were asleep I looked around to see if, to see if anyone was looking for you. He had actually been looking to see if his parents were looking for him, but knowing his situation it would probably be best not to say that. I found your info online. Kota Izumi, age 6. You ran away from home a while ago and your guardians have been looking for you. Izuku explained. I got in contact with the pussycats and they said they would be here to pick you in a few days and until then you'll be staying here. No. I don't want to go back. Let me go. Let me go. Kota tired but he couldn't even really struggle against Sanson's goo. Izuka looked at Eri and Kyoku. Could you two go play with your siblings? But Dash, Kyoku, and Eri didn't like leaving Izuku's side. As such, they were basically attached to Izuku's side. Please. Izuku insisted, giving them both a begging look. Izuka didn't ask them for much beyond behaving themselves. So all the kids felt inclined to do as he said whenever he asked something. Kyoku and Eri especially. After some hesitation, the two nodded and left the room. Izuka walked towards Koda, stopping once he reached a close but still respectful distance. 
He didn't want to make the poor boy any more uncomfortable than he was already. If you promise not to keep struggling, then I'll tell Sanson to get off of you, Izuku told him. I don't want to have to restrain you like this, but I also don't want you to hurt yourself. Just let me go. Koda continued to struggle with no progress. Izuku waited patiently sitting on his chair a few feet away. I feel bad for having Sanson stay here. I know she likes moving around after all. Hopefully he tires himself out soon. An hour later. As it turns out, Koda was not a boy who was easily discouraged. As he continued trying to struggle for the next hour. And given the fact that his body wasn't actually moving, he wasn't actually using much energy so it took him a while to tucker himself out. In the meantime, in order to entertain Sanson, Izuka had set up a table between them and the two of them started playing tic-tac-toe, Sanson making a hand and stretching it over to play. So I guess this confirms that she doesn't have to make a head to see. Izuka thought as he made another X. So does that just mean she can see using her entire body? I'll have to ask her later. I won. Sanson cheered, using her arm to show her excitement. Izuku was letting her win some of these, of course. He loved seeing her get excited. As he got ready to start a new game, Koda spoke. Fine. I give up. Just get her off of me. Koda sighed in defeat. Did he stop moving? Izuku asked Sanson, who in response turned her hand into a head and nodded. All right. You can go play with the others now. Izuka said. Sanson smiled and untangled herself from Koda before bouncing out of the room. No bouncing in the house. You'll break something. Izuku called after her. After a few moments, Izuka sighed and looked back at Koda who was glaring at him. Are you okay? Izuka asked him kindly. I'm sorry that I have to keep you here but you could get seriously hurt otherwise. I'm fine. Koda insisted. Achoo. Immediately Izuka gained a concerned expression and he put his head on Koda's forehead. A fever, just as I thought, Izuka said. Koda was about to tell him to get off when suddenly he got a case of deja vu. The way Izuka held his hand on his head and the look on his face and even the words he was saying reminded him off. Izuka took his hand off him and walked to the door. I have to go make lunch. I'll make you some soup and get you some medicine. I don't need dash. Jirarar. Koda's face went red with embarrassment as his stomach protested what his mouth was saying. In truth, Koda was more than hungry. He was starving. But he also really didn't want to take anything from this Izuka guy. However, the pain in his stomach reminded him of what little choice he had in the matter. TCH, fine. Koda said begrudgingly. Izuka gave a soft smile. At least I don't have to try and force him to eat. K, could you come here please? Izuka called out to the living room. K? Koda wondered who this K person was. After a few moments, the snake-haired girl ran into the room. Yes, Dad? Kay asked, a big smile on her face. When did she start calling me that? Izuka shook his head. Could you watch Koda while I prepare food for everyone? Okay. Can I have something with eggs in it? Kay asked, her snakes hissing with excitement. Not today. Maybe tomorrow. Izuka said. It's okay. The longer I wait for eggs, then the yummier they are when I have them. Kay said, repeating something Izuka once told her. Izuka smiled back at her before petting the snakes on her head a little. That's right. Thank you. No problem. I'm a rock solid pick. K giggled. Moving on to rock puns, at least you're adding some variety. Izuka tried to cringe at the terrible puns to come. With that Izuku left for the kitchen and K hopped on Izuku's chair. Hi. My name's Kesaki. Kesaki Midoriya. But you can call me K. K introduced herself. What's your name? Koda was caught off guard by both her attitude and appearance and so all he said was, Ahi, you okay? Snake got your tongue? Kay asked him jokingly, her snakes cackling in delight. Are those alive? Koda asked. He'd never seen a quirk that gave someone living snake hair. It was cool but also kind of worrisome. Kind of. Kay shrugged. She moved a finger up to her hair and started petting the snakes. It's like they're part of me but also not. Izuka says it's like having multiple personalities, but I don't know what that means and when he tried to explain it I got confused. That didn't really answer Koda's question and only left the boy more confused. Anyway, you never said what your name is. K reminded him. It's Koda. Koda Izumi. Koda introduced himself. Cool, what's your quirk? K asked him. Mines turns people to stone when they look at my eyes. That's dangerous. Koda thought until he remembered he can't see her eyes through the visor she's wearing. 
Kay frowned a bit at his initial panic but quickly went back to her default happy state. Don't worry. I won't turn you to stone. This visor stops my cork stone cold. My control over my cork it rocky and I kept accidentally using it on people by Miss Snake. Stop. Coda groaned. Please stop. Your jokes are terrible. Ah, uh, not another one, Kay complained. One day I'll find someone who likes my puns. I doubt it. Coda deadpanned. Kay perked back up again. So what's your quirk? Why so you can make more bad jokes? Coda asked her rudely. No. So I can make more awesome jokes. Kay corrected him. I'm definitely not telling you my quirk, Coda responded. Kay pouted for a moment before she got an idea. Okay. Let's play a game. A game? Coda repeated skeptically. You tell me your favorite food and I'll see if I can guess your quirk. Kay said. What does food have to do with quirks? Coda asked. Lots. Izuka says that quirks can make someone really like a food or really not like a food. Kay explained. Like how I love eggs because of my snakes and how Fu loves meat because he's a zombie and Eri loves apples because she's part unicorn. Unicorns aren't real. Coda pointed out. Yes, they are. Eri has a horn, so that means she's part unicorn. Kay responded. Lots of real animals have horns. Maybe she's part bull or something. Coda said. But Eri only has one horn. And unicorns are the only animals that have one horn. So Eri's part unicorn. Kay crossed her arms and smiled proudly at her foolproof argument. Coda tried to come up with a rebuttal, but he realized he didn't know any animals with only one horn. There are other animals with one horn. Do you know any? Kay smirked smugly. No. Coda looked away from her, embarrassed and refusing to admit defeat. Then I win. Kay stood up proudly in the chair. Now tell me your favorite food. TCH. Sushi. Coda answered hesitantly. Okay, sushi. Kay concentrated on trying to figure out his quirk. Sushi's made of fish. Do you have a shark quirk? No, Coda responded. How about a whale quirk? Kay asked. Do I look like a whale? Coda gave her an are you serious look. Is that a no? Kay asked. No. Coda answered. How about? Sometime later. What about dash? It's water. Coda shouted in frustration. My quirk lets me shoot out and control water. Oh, eh. Kay pouted in frustration. I focus too much on animals. I didn't even know that many animals ate fish, Coda admitted. I like animals. I want to take care of them when I get older. Kay said enthusiastically. What do you want to do when you get older? Why do you care so much? Coda asked her in return. Why do you keep asking me all these dumb questions? Hmm. I don't know. I guess I want to know more about you. Kay admitted. I don't know anyone else other than my new family. And all the people besides my new family are really mean. But you're kind of nice. There were a lot of things in what she just said that left him confused. Mostly the last thing she said. You think I'm nice? Yeah. Most people call me ugly when they see me. Or scary. Or a lot of other bad things. And when they find out what my quirk is they call me a monster. Kay said without losing even a hint of her cheeriness. But you didn't call me any bad things. So you've been nice to me. That's, that's not being nice all those other guys are just jerks. Coda pointed out. He may not be the nicest person around, but even he knew it was rude, to say the least, to call someone a monster. How could this girl say all that with a smile on her face? Izuka says that too. He says I should ignore them because they don't know what they're talking about. Kay repeated what Izuka said. Well, he's right. Coda didn't think that Kay was particularly pretty or easy to look at and he'd be lying if he said he wanted her and her snakes to get much closer to him. But judging someone because of their quirk was dumb in his opinion. Quirks are dumb, Coda muttered. Before Kay could respond to that, Izuku came back into the room. Food's done. Since I was making soup for Coda, I decided to make some for everyone else too. Izuku explained. Okay. Kay hopped off the chair and ran to the door before looking up at Izuku. Is Coda gonna eat with us? Well, he can't move too much so I don't think he can make it to the table, Izuka said. That irritated Coda. It's not like he wanted to eat with everyone, but he didn't like someone saying what he could and couldn't do. I can get to the table. Coda protested he tried to move again only for pain to shoot through his body. Stopping him completely. Ah, don't move. Izuka told him. If you want to eat with everyone I can figure something out. Izuku made his way over to Koda and carefully he picked up the small child and took him into his arms. 
Koda wanted to object to being handled by Izuku, but something about the way Izuka held him was pleasantly familiar. It was warm and comfortable, disarming in a way Koda couldn't put his finger on. He only snapped back to reality when Izuka set him down in his chair. Wah? Koda looked around and saw all the other kids staring at him. And there were more kids than Koda had been expecting. Not including Izuku, there were six in total. Hmm. He's rather plain looking. Kiba inspected him. I don't think he's plain, I think we just look weird. Fu deadpanned. Humph. Kyoka pouted and looked away from Koda. Her disdain for him was very evident. Guys, you should introduce yourselves first, Izuku told them. Ah, uh, my apologies, caretaker, I forgot my manners. Kiba apologized before standing up in the chair. My name is Kiba Midoriya, proud member of the Midoriya clan and the immortal destined ruler of mankind. Koda gave her the most confused look he'd given anyone in his life. What? She's a weirdo, she says stuff like that, but it doesn't really mean anything, Fu explained. Hey! Kiba shouted in outrage. My name is Fu Midoriya. Fu gave a simple introduction. Sansan Miwia. Sansan tried to introduce herself, confusing Koda even more. Her name is Sansan Midoriya. She has a hard time speaking because she's made of slime. Kay explained with a smile. You already know this, but my name's Kesaki Midoriya. There was a short pause as it took a moment for the less eager members of the family to speak up. I am Eri Midoriya, Eri said just loud enough for them to hear. It's nice to meet you. I'm Kyoka Midoriya. Kyoka curtly introduced herself. Izuka gave Kyoku a concerned look for a moment before moving on. Okay, everyone this is Koda. As you know he'll be staying with us for a few days until his guardians come back to get him. Guardians? Kiba asked. Does he have bodyguards? And no, I mean his legal guardians, Izuku explained. A legal guardian is someone who watches over you and is in charge of your well-being. I'm considered the legal guardian for all of you. So are his parents coming? Kay asked. No, Koda responded almost immediately. He glared at the ground fiercely. No, they're not. Let's not talk about Koda parents, Izuka said nervously. They're a sore topic. It's not like our parents were nice to either. Did they abandon him too? Kyoka said bitterly. Koda froze completely. Kyoku. Izuka picked her up. We are having a talk, young lady. The rest of you can eat. I'll be back in a moment. Please behave yourselves. With that, Izuka took Kyoku and left. Sorry about her. Fu apologized. She doesn't dash. What did she mean? Koda asked all of a sudden. What? Fu asked. She asked if my parents abandoned me too. Koda repeated Kyoku's words. What did she mean? Oh, well, most of our parents didn't want us after our quirks came, Fu explained. So they threw us out. Threw you out? But I thought Izuku was your dad. Koda was really, really confused. Caretaker found us and decided to take care of us. We are not related by blood, but he adopted us and serves as our father. Kiba explains. Adopted? Koda asked, not knowing what that word meant. You don't know what adopted means? Kay asked, reckoning a head shake from Koda. Well, if a mommy and daddy don't want their child, someone else can take them and become their new mommy or daddy, or both. Wait, moms and dads can leave their kids? Koda asked. While this was common sense to most, this was news to Koda. As far as he was concerned, parents had kids and they took care of them until either the kid either got older or the parents died. Hearing that parents could just leave their kids bewildered him. He couldn't imagine his parents just leaving him. But they did? Koda thought. They choose their stupid hero jobs over me. They they abandoned me. Are you okay, Koda? Kay asked him with concern in her voice. Huh? Koda was snapped out of his thoughts. He felt something wet on his face and after bringing his hand up to his cheek, he realized he had been crying. His face turned red from embarrassment and he quickly tried to save face. I'm fine. Let's just eat already. Koda quickly tried to go for his food, but he moved a bit too fast. Ow. The other kids shot Koda some more concerned looks, but eventually moved on and started eating. The next day Koda felt a lot better. All the top-of-the-line medicine, soup, and lots of bed rest had done their job properly, and while Koda wasn't fully healthy again, he did feel well enough to move. Izuka still made him stay in bed for the most part, and unfortunately, there wasn't a lot for him to do while bedridden. And so that's what led to where he is right now, watching Izuku and Eri do Eri's quirk training. Just remember the video of that river I showed you, Izuka told her. Just imagine a slow stream. 
Koda watched in silence, confused as to why Izuku was handing her an apple core. Eri clutched the apple core tightly and took a deep breath. Her horn grew and energy started cascading over her. The apple core slowly started regrowing the eaten parts of the apple it once was. Ah! MMMMRRR. Eri tried as hard as she could to tame her quirk, trying to keep it from running rampant and going out of control. She imagined that River Izuku showed her on the computer, she tried to slow the stream. Koda watched in awe as the apple slowly but surely put the apple back together. Once the apple was mostly restored, however, Eri's grip on her quirk started to slip. Once Izuku noticed her horn growing even more, he saw the apple coming back faster. He took a metal ruler and slapped the apple out of her hand. Ah, I can't control it, Eri said as she started to completely lose control. Koda's eyes widened as Eri's energy started growing and getting more wild and erratic. He inched back on the bed, sliding further away from her. Eri, you can stop now. Imagine a dam. Imagine the river stopping. Izuku told her. Eri tried her best, her horns started shrinking a little, but almost immediately it started growing again. It kept shrinking and growing for a while, but it was clear that Eri was fighting a losing battle. With an upset look on his face, Izuka grabbed the trank gun that was in his pocket, took it out, and aimed it at Eri. Wait, is he going to shoot her? Koda thought in alarmed confusion. And indeed he did, Izuka shot Eri's arm with the gun, and the dart embedded itself into her arm. A few seconds later, Eri's eyes started to droop, her horn stopped emitting energy and began sinking back into her, and in another few seconds, Eri's quirk completely deactivated and she started falling over. Izuku caught her just before she fell and lifted her into his arms. You shot her, Koda stated. He was dumbfounded, clueless as to what just happened or why. It's a dark gun, Izuku explained, pulling the dart out of Eri's arm and showing it to Koda. It's not meant to hurt someone like a real gun, it shoots out these needle things called darts, they're filled with something that makes you go to sleep for a while. Don't worry, she'll be fine when she wakes up. Oh. Things made slightly more sense knowing Izuka hadn't shot her with a real gun, but Koda was still really confused about the rest of the situation. Why did you shoot her? Well, Eri's quirk is... Izuka stopped talking as he put Eri onto a futon he had set up beforehand. After he finished putting Eri to sleep on the futon, he got up, moved his chair over to the bed, sat down, and faced Koda. What do you think of quirk bias Koda? Izuku asked him. I don't know what that is, Koda answered simply. Oh, right, sorry. Izuka blushed with embarrassment. Quirk bias is when someone judges someone else because of their quirks. Some people think people are bad if they have scary quirks, or they think someone is better than others because they have a strong quirk. Oh, that. Koda's tone was bitter and his eyes gave away his disdain for the concept. It's stupid. Quirks are all stupid but quirk bays or whatever is even dumber. Izuka sighed with relief. He had gotten the answer he hoped for. Now he could tell him. Okay, Ares' quirk is, it's complicated. As long as it's a living thing like a human, plant, or animal, she can return it back to how it used to be. Izuka tried to explain it in the simplest way possible. Like if someone bit an apple, she can make the apple whole again, or if someone is hurt, she can make them healthy again. Eri has a hard time holding back her quirk. And if she touches someone while her quirk is at full power, they go back to before they existed. What does that mean? Koda didn't quite understand what he meant. They die, Koda, Izuku explained simply. If a person touches her while her quirk's at full power, they die. Koda's eyes became the size of dinner plates. Wait, die? Like they're dead? Yes, Koda, they die, Izuku told him. He didn't like telling people about Eri's quirk, but if Koda was going to be with them for a while, he deserved and needed to know about the danger of Eri's quirk. That's really dangerous. Koda freaked out slightly at the thought that he could have died if he'd been just a few feet closer to Eri. Yes, it is. Izuka nodded. So we have to be very careful when we're doing her quirk training. Why are you training her quirk? Shouldn't she not use her quirk at all? Unless... Koda made a bitter face as a thought crossed his mind. Does she want to be a hero too? Eri? No. I don't think so anyway. I think she wants to be a doctor or nurse or something. Izuka told him but sometimes Eri's quirk turns on by itself. If she gets really stressed or panics too much, it'll turn on and she can't control it. So we do the quirk training so she can control it one day and no one will have to be afraid of her quirk anymore. That made sense to Koda, kind of. He still thought it would be better if she just never used her quirk. A quirk that dangerous was scary. 
And then another thought came to his mind. Izuku apparently adopted all these kids. That would include Eri. So apparently Izuku had signed himself up for taking care of a girl that could kill him with a touch. And so naturally the question that came to his mind was, Why? Koda asked him. Why? Izuku repeated. Why did you adopt Eri? Koda asked. And what happened to her real parents? Izuku sighed. Eri, Eri's story is a very sad one. And once you're not ready to hear. But it goes like this. When Eri's quirk manifested, her parents were scared of it. So they gave her away to a bad man who hurt her a lot. She ran away from him and that's when I found her. I hid her and I called the heroes and they arrested the bad man. But Eri's parents still didn't want her. And even if they did, they couldn't just take her back after abandoning her. And Eri's quirk was scary, very scary, so a lot of people didn't want to adopt her. But I did. Why? Koda asked. It's not like he hated Eri, but he'd be lying if he said he wasn't afraid of her quirk. Did the others know? Why weren't they afraid? She had nowhere to go because of her quirk, something she couldn't control, her life was almost ruined. Nobody wanted to be near her and it wasn't because of anything she did. Izuku explained. And I know how painful that is. They all do. They all do? Does everyone here have dangerous quirks? Koda asked. All the kids do, Izuku told him. I don't. I don't have a quirk at all. Izuku said. Koda's eyes were starting to hurt from the constant widening. This was a lot for him to process. Since when could people not have quirks? The world has a very limited view of what quirks are okay and what quirks are not, Izuku explained. And if you fall into the second category, then the world will hurt and shun you. Koda thought about that. He knew the world was cruel. It had taken his parents from him after all. But his parents made the choice to leave him behind. These people didn't have any choice. That just made the world seem a little bit darker. What do you think of Hiro's Koda? Izuku asked him. Koda's face almost instantly tightened into a scowl. I think they're stupid. Heroes and villains all show off their flashy quirks and kill each other for no reason. Izuku frowned. I guess from his point of view. With such a limited view of the world, it does seem like all that violence is happening for no reason. Maybe if I can explain it just right. After a bit of thought, Izuku spoke. Koda, why do you think villains exist? To fight heroes, Koda answered. Izuku shook his head. That's not why. Villains exist because there are bad people. Bad people who want to hurt others. Why? Koda asked. Well, sometimes they want to steal things from them for money, or sometimes they just want to hurt people because they like hurting people. It wasn't a completely accurate explanation, but he would learn the nuisance as he got older. Heroes exist to protect people from those villains. Without heroes, those people would be free to hurt people all they want. They'd kill a lot more people. And no one could stop them. Why don't people just use their quirks to stop them? Koda asked. Izuka shook his head again. If people could only use their quirks to defend themselves, then that would make quirks even more important. The world would completely revolve around quirks, and people with weak quirks or quirkless people would suffer even more. Koda frowned as he imagined the world Izuku was describing. The world was already obsessed with quirks. All he heard was quirk this, quirk that. If the world became even more obsessed with quirks. Do you see why heroes are necessary now? Izuku asked Koda. Koda didn't answer. He couldn't find an argument to counter what Izuka said. It all made sense, at least more than before. But he just couldn't let go of his outlook. He wasn't ready to. Izuka took a deep breath. He was about to approach a sensitive topic and one he himself probably shouldn't get involved in. But now seemed like a better time than ever. Koda, your parents didn't die for no reason. And they didn't abandon you. Izuka told him. They died so a dozen other little boys and girls didn't lose their parents. Koda remained silent, looking away from Izuku. The two sat in silence for a while, until... Crash. The sound of something breaking the living room reached their ears. Izuku facebombed. Oh, please don't be Kiba again. Koda, just rest. And T try to think about what I told you. Please. With that, Izuku ran to the living room, leaving Koda to his thoughts. Later that night... Hey. Koda was woken from his sleep by someone's voice. MMMM. Koda groaned. He didn't want to wake up. Turning out thinking was tiring if you did it a lot. Wake up. The voice whispered. Koda felt whoever it was calling him shake him a little. Go away, Koda told them. Grr. Wake up or I'll make you think you're a plan. The voice whispered angrily. Koda thought about that for a moment. 
It sounded ridiculous, but if all the other kids here had powerful quirks like Izuka said they did, then they probably could do something like that. Deciding he'd rather not be a plant, Koda opened his eyes. Turns out the one waking him up was Kyoku. And she did not look pleased. Although to be fair, Koda only ever saw her frowning so apparently she just really didn't like him. Come with me. Kyoku told him. Koda didn't really want to follow her. He was tired and wanted to go back to bed. Plus this girl was mean and he didn't feel like going anywhere with her. But on the other hand, she could make him think he's a plant. Koda decided to get up and follow her, leaving the room and entering the living room. Sanson and Fu were watching TV. Sanson was copying the heroes on TV while Fu was writing things down in a notebook. Fu looked at them for a moment with his constantly neutral expression. Why are you two up? Why are you up? Koda asked in return. The pussycats, Izuku, and back when they were alive, his parents had all stressed how important it was that he sleep at night. And it seemed like Izuka had a similar mentality towards all the other children, so why were these two up? Our bodies are weird, so we don't need sleep, Fu explained. We can sleep, but Izuka doesn't force us to. But you guys definitely do need sleep. So why are you up? We're just gonna talk for a few minutes, and then we'll go back to bed. I promise. Kyoka told Fu. Fu squinted at Kyoka trying to decide whether or not he believed them. Izuka typically trusted him as the reasonable one to keep everyone else in line. But still, if it was just a little bit, don't take too long or I'll tell Izuku. With that warning given, Fu turned back to the TV and to his notes. With that, Kyoka led Koda into the kitchen where she finally stopped. She turned to him and gave him a very serious look that most adults would have found more cute than anything else. I don't like you, Kyoka told him. I know. Koda crossed his arms, trying to look tough. You're rude to daddy even after he saved you. You would have died if he didn't do that, you know. Kyoka pointed out. Koda's expression actually turned a bit sheepish. He knew he had been in bad shape, but he didn't know his life was in danger. He already felt kind of bad after seeing how nice Izuku was, but now he felt really bad about how mean he was. And he gave you food, let you sleep in the bed, and treated you nicely. Kyoka told him. Okay, I get it. Koda lashed out. But, Kyoka said, her tone suddenly changing to a slightly more patient one. I looked through your memories and I'm sorry I was mean to you too. Read my memories? Koda asked, ignoring the apology in favor of the more interesting and possibly frightening part of that sentence. Yes, my quirk let me see and change memories. Kyoka explained. So I know about your parents. Yeah. S so what? Koda put back on his tough guy persona the mention of his parents snapping him out of his guilt trip. So I'm sorry. It must have hurt losing them. If I lost Izuku. Kyoka didn't finish that sentence. She wiped away a few tears forming in her eyes at the thought of losing Izuku after finding him. But I can help you. Help me? Koda repeated, not sure where she was going with this. I don't need help. Yes, you do. Kyoka shouted. You're so mean because you're angry, so maybe if you're not angry, you'll be nice. And how are you gonna do that? Koda pouted. Well, you're angry because your parents died. So you'll stop being angry if you can't remember your parents. Kyoku explained. Koda's expression fell as she slowly realized what Kyoku was suggesting. I'll erase all the memories of your parents, then you can live here and Izuka can be your parent. Kyoku laid out her plan, of course not seeing the several issues with it. But to Koda, the plan sounded solid. All the pain and sadness he felt, the betrayal, the confusing complicated thoughts. All of it would be gone. And things could kind of go back to how they used to be. Izuku was a nice person and he clearly cared for these kids as his parents cared for him. It could work. If not for one problem. He really, really hated that idea. The thought of all the memories of his parents disappearing. His parents just completely disappearing from his mind. He hated it. No, Koda said in a low voice. W what? Kyoku was taken aback. She clearly was not expecting that answer. I said no, Koda said louder. I don't want to forget my parents. Why? Kyoka asked him mad that her perfect plan hit a snag. You kept saying that they abandoned you, that they left you, and that you hated them. That was another thing about Koda that made her angry. She had to look and work to find a family that loved her, and he was just born with one. He was born with a family that loved him and after they were gone he became ungrateful of what he had. Sure, Izuka told her he was angry and confused about his parents dying, but even if Izuka died while she would be extremely angry and sad, she would never say anything bad about him. 
Why yeah well I dash, Kota felt what he wanted to say, it was stuck in his throat, but he just couldn't say it. What? Why don't you want to forget people you hate so much? Kyoku asked. Because, because I don't hate them. Kota shouted, tears sliding down his face. I don't hate them. I was wrong. I miss them. I don't want to forget. I want them back. Kota started crying. All his pent-up sadness which he'd been coving with anger was now rushing out like water coming from a broken dam. I want them back. Kota cried. Kyoka looked at Kota crying his eyes out and her anger was replaced by sympathy, regret, and discomfort. Before either of them could do anything however, Kota suddenly felt a hand patting his head. The two children looked up and saw Azuka standing behind the two of them. Daddy! Kyoka panicked, her and a crying Kota did not look good for her. I can explain. It's okay, Izuka said in the most soothing voice he could. I heard most of it. You two were very loud. You woke up basically everyone, except Kiba. Oh, oh. Kyoka blushed with embarrassment. She thought she was being sneaky, but her emotional side got the best of her. I'm not mad, but we will be talking about this tomorrow, okay, Izuka said. For now, Kyoku, please go to bed. I'll deal with Koda. Okay. Kyoka said quietly before making her way out of the kitchen. With that, Izuku put all his attention towards Koda. It's okay, let it all out. It's always safe to cry here. That was all Koda needed to hear. He cried and cried and cried while Izuka kneeled down and patted him on the back to try and comfort him. After a few minutes had passed, Koda's crying began to slow. I, I miss them. Koda admitted. I know, Izuka told him. I said all those bad things about them. I didn't. I know, Izuka said. We all say stupid things when we're angry. It's okay. No one is mad at you. The crying and comforting continued for quite some time until Koda was quite frankly too physically and emotionally exhausted to keep going on. Once Koda tuckered himself out, Izuka took him and laid him in bed. The next morning, when Koda woke up, he was immediately met with warmth. Something or someone was next to him. He opened his eyes and was immediately met by the visor of K. You're awake. K exclaimed excitedly. Uh? Koda was confused by her sudden closeness. We were worried about you. You cried a whole lot and we were worried and so we watched you to make sure you were okay. Kay explained almost too quickly for Koda to understand her. W.E.? Koda asked. Kay nodded and moved out of the way revealing that Izuku was sleeping in his chair behind her with Eri and Kyoku on his lap. And Sanson's on the ceiling. Kay pointed up. Sanson came down and formed her face right in front of Koda's face. I. Sanson greeted him. Koda sat still, stunned for a moment. He was kind of a mess emotionally and so he couldn't help but feel thankful for these people who he had only met a few days ago were so concerned for his safety. T thanks, Koda said, blushing in embarrassment for crying in front of a bunch of people. You're welcome, K said, smiling brightly. All the noise in front of him quickly roused Izuku from his slumber. Huh? Oh. Koda, you're awake. Izuka quickly jolted awake, waking up to two sleeping children on his knees. Daddy? Kyoka slowly opened her eyes. Izuku? Eri did the same. Oh, it looks like everyone's awake now, Izuka said. Could you guys please check on Kiba and Fu, make sure Kiba didn't break anything in her sleep again, or that Fu didn't get blood anywhere besides the sheets? Oh, and then after that could you set the table so I can cook breakfast? I'm thinking American-style pancakes. The children nodded and some quirkier than others moved out of the room to do their assigned task, leaving Izuku alone with Koda. Are you okay? Izuku asked him gently. Sorry if they overwhelmed you, they were really worried about it. K especially. It's fine. I'm okay. Koda muttered quietly. There was a moment of silence between them as Izuku didn't quite know what to say next with how Koda was right now. Thank you. Koda unexpectedly apologized. For what? Izuka looked at him in confusion. For all the stuff you did. And said. Koda explained to him. And for letting me cry like that. Oh, it's fine. Izuka smiled at him. My job is to help kids in need. And you need help, so I helped you. Koda just nodded. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. Izuka looked at his desk and his phone was vibrating along its surface. He moved out of his chair and picked it up. Hello? Izuka answered. Koda watched as Izuka talked with an unknown person on the phone for a while. Oh, okay, in a few hours? All right, I'll make some breakfast for him then. Ah, uh, do you want any? Oh, that's okay. He'll be ready by the time you get here, okay? 
No, it was no issue. He's a very nice boy. He was just a bit confused. Some things happened. Everything is okay. All right. Bye. Izuka hung up the phone. He turned to Koda. That was Mandalay. She and the pussycats are coming in a few hours to pick you up. Koda's mood immediately worsened. Oh. Izuku walked up to him and rustled his hair and gave him an encouraging smile. You're always welcome here. If you want to see us, just ask the pussycats. Koda nodded, seemingly slightly less upset than before. Okay, why don't you sit down with the other kids and I'll make breakfast? Izuku asked. The boy nodded immediately if the rest of his cooking was as good as the soup he made, then he would be in for a treat. A few hours later, Izuku, Koda, and the kids stood outside of the apartment building while the pussycat's van, which they refused to call the Pussy Mobile, rolled up in front of them. And then the pussycats came out. Rock on with these sparkling gazes. We've come to lend a paw and help. Coming out of nowhere. Stingingly cute and cat-like. Wild, wild pussycats. All the pussycats shouted their signature motto while doing their signature poses, despite being in their civilian clothes. And the reactions varied. Izuku, Kiba, and Sanson all had stars in their eyes. Oh wow. The wild wild pussycat's signature motto. Right in front of me. Izuka geeked out. That motto. Those poses. I must come up with some of my own. Kiba said. Go. Sanson was always a fan of flashing and energetic movements, so this was right up her alley. Kyoku and Fu were overall less amused. Great, I know what Kiba's going to make me practice for the next week. He groaned internally. These are pro heroes? Kyoku expected them to be a bit more serious. Eri didn't know what to think about that, she was just confused. Koda was in the same camp Fu and Kyoku were in, that despite having several changes in opinion and changes in the way he looked at the world, that still seemed just as lame as ever. However, before he could show his embarrassment, Mandalay broke formation and wrapped him up in a hug. Koda, I can't believe you did that. We were so worried about you. The heroine embraced the child, nearly smothering him. I know, I know I'm sorry. Koda apologized while trying his best to push her away from him. This surprised Mandalay slightly. Ever since Koda had come to them had been stubborn and difficult. This was the first time she had ever heard him apologize for anything. After thoroughly checking to make sure Koda was completely unharmed, Mandalay moved on, allowing the other pussycats to fuss over the boy, much to his chagrin. Mandalay walked up to Izuku and gave a grateful bow. Thank you for finding and taking care of him. If he had died before we found him, I would have never been able to forgive myself. No, no, it's fine. I just did the right thing. He was very well behaved. Izuka said, trying to keep his composure and failing. Really? Asked Mandalay, not buying that Koda had been well behaved for a bunch of strangers he'd just met. W.L., he was a little. Izuka tried to find a way to phrase it. Mean? Kyoka said. Stubborn? Fu added. Difficult. Izuka finished. But that was just because of, well you know. He's had a rough time but he's a good kid. I hope you don't punish him too harshly. Well, I think almost dying in the rain is enough punishment for the moment. Mandalay decided. Koda breathed a sigh of relief. But don't think you're not going to get a very stern talking to when we get home. Mandalay shouted out loud. Koda made a loud groan. Mandalay turned her attention back to Izuku. By the way, I never asked for your names. Oh, right? Izuka blushed at forgetting something so simple. My name is Izuka Midoriya. Kiba Midoriya. Kiba said proudly. Fu Midoriya, Fu said in his typical monotone. Sanson Midoriya. Sanson said while she constantly moved around and looked at the pussycats. K Midoriya. Nice to meet Naya. K snickered at her own pun. Kyoka Midoriya. Kyoka said from behind Izuka's leg. Eri Midoriya. Ari introduced herself. H. Hi. Ah, well, aren't these just the cutest little kittens? Pixie Bob said. Are these all your younger siblings? Mandalay asked Izuku. Izuku laughed nervously. Well, you see Dash. He's our dad. Kay explained. Huh? All the pussy cats went wide eyed and looked at Izuku in confusion, hoping for an explanation to that very strange claim. It's a very bizarre, complicated, and long story that I will probably have to keep explaining to people for the rest of my life. Izuka sighed. He was going to need to find a better way to explain all this. But let's just say I adopted them all due to some rather strange circumstances. Ah, I get it, Ragdoll said. I still have a lot of questions but I'll hold my tongue for now, Pixie Bob said. 
Mandalay, we have to go, we still have to report for work within the hour. Tiger reminded them. Right? Mandalay frowned. Unfortunately, due to their job, they didn't always have time to watch Koda, which is how he managed to run away in the first place. She looked at Izuku and then suddenly she got an idea. Midoriya, I know you've already done so much for us already, but can I ask you something? Mandalay asked him. Oh, of course. I'd be honored. Izuka jittered. We're rather busy sometimes and we don't always have time to look after Koda. Would you mind babysitting him from time to time? Mandalay pleaded. You seem to be a good influence and he could use some friends. Izuka smiled. Why yes. I'd be more than happy to. He's more than welcome here. A although we are moving soon but it's not too far away from the city. Actually, I think it might be closer to you than here. Thank you. I am really grateful. Mandalay said sincerely. Koda. It looks like you'll be staying here for a little bit longer. Yay, we get to see Koda more. Kay cheered, Sanson joining in her celebration. Well, it seems we shall be friends from this point on. Consider it an honor. Kiba told Koda. Welcome to the Damaged Children Club, Fu told him. Is he going to be our friend? Eri asked, receiving a nod from Izuku. Oh, oh. Okay. All the kids looked at Kyoku, the one who had the biggest problem with outsiders. Humph. It's fine as long as he stops being mean. Kyoka turned her head away. I promise and thanks. Koda also looked away trying to keep people from seeing his blush. Izuka smiled genuinely at the scene in front of him. It seems all well that ends well. And he didn't even have to adopt this one. And that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. If you did please like, subscribe, share the video and support the original writer. See you in the next video.